Hello, everybody. Today, I want to take us through a few demos, three of them, to help us believe that those beautiful one-dimensional elastic collision equations that we derived actually describe reality, right? That they aren't just some math we did, right? But that they're actually physics. They describe what happens in an elastic collision. Now, because we did this lab inside of Pivot, right, I'm going to use some of the actual things we did in Pivot Interactives. And this would be the collisions lab that we did. So I would ask that at this point that you take out your collisions lab sheet. Okay, find your collisions lab sheet so that you can compare your results to mine and these demos. And in particular, we're going to use um, three of the four magnet end ones that you did. The magnet ends, while not perfectly elastic, are pretty darn close, right? They were just a few percent away from being completely elastic. Right, so we're going to use those as examples. Even though they're not perfect, they're pretty close. Right? It's a decent approximation. So here's the setup, just like we used in the uh, derivation. We have two masses we'll call M1 and M2. They're initially moving at V1i and V2i. After they collide elastically, okay, big magic word there, th we want to know what are their final velocities, V1f and V2f. Okay. Now, remember, what's special about elastic collisions is that both momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. And since they're both conserved, we have kind of two degrees of freedom, and we can find two unknowns. This is as opposed to the much more typical inelastic collision in which only momentum is conserved, as long as it's an isolated system, and therefore we can only have one unknown. Right, to find. We only have one equation we can make and solve. So here's our first of three uh, cases that we're going to examine. What if the second object starts at rest and the two objects have the same mass? Right, you can probably find one of those on your lab sheet. Right? I'm even going to show you a little movie clip here in a moment to remind you. So M2 is at rest and the masses are the same. So what do the equations predict? Well, here's our first one to find the final velocity of the first mass. You'll notice I did one little tricky thing here. Since the masses are the same, rather than, you know, get all intense with the M1, M2s, I can just use Ms. Which pretty clearly shows here that M minus M will be zero, and zero times this velocity is zero, so that whole term cancels. And since in this case M2 is going to start at rest, V2i would be zero, and zero times anything is zero. Everybody see that? So that means the equation predicts that the first ball is going to stop when it hits the second ball. Hmm, interesting. What does the second equation say? Well, this is for the final velocity of the second ball. Just like before, V2i is zero. Right? It's starting from rest, so that whole term cancels. Over here, we're left with 2m over m plus m, but m plus m is, of course, 2m. And 2m over 2m is 1. And so it predicts that the second ball will end up moving with the same velocity as the original velocity of the first ball. So if you can imagine this, right, this ball comes along, hits the second ball, first ball stops, second ball gets all the velocity. Now, I hope some of you are actually saying to yourself, you know what, I've seen this somewhere. Have you ever played pool or billiards, right? If you hit the cue ball dead into a second ball that's at rest, as normally would be the case when you play pool, right? isn't this what happens? And, and please, no English on the ball, no spinning, right? So the first ball stops, the cue ball stops dead, and the second ball basically picks up all the velocity. Right? That's what these equations predict. Now, again, pool balls wouldn't be 100% elastic. They'd be pretty darn close because they're really hard and rigid. You know, Maybe uh, there's quite a bit of sound um, that you hear, but probably a little worse than the magnet ends, but still. Okay, so... Let's take a look at the video. Um, if you look down here, you'll notice that we have small mass into stationary small mass, right? So exactly what we talked about, right? And let's watch what happens. Watch it again. Come back. <laughs> 
See the first one stop and the second one basically go off with the same velocity, right? And if you're worried if your eyes deceive you, well, we actually analyzed this, if you remember. This was my data. Take a look at yours. Find this one. Find this scenario. Small mass into stationary small mass. Notice that the masses were the same, right? And you should have data that is in this ballpark, I hope. So notice the left glider starts out going about 22.7 centimeters per second. After, right, it stops. The first glider, or the right glider, sorry, starts out at rest. After, it's going about 22.2 centimeters per second. Do you notice it picks up most of the speed, right, from the left glider? Now, it's not exact, but that's because this wasn't 100% elastic, right? Pretty close, though, right? Pretty darn close on an air track so we don't have to worry about frictional effects and the carts don't actually touch because of the magnet ends. So pretty elastic, right? But hopefully enough to convince you that the equations that we saw actually predicted what we saw in nature. Hmm. Well, let's look at a second one, a little more complex. Now, we're going to keep the masses the same because that really helps everything. But this time, the velocities are going to be different. Okay, so um, they're both moving, different velocities to start out with. Okay, so what do the equations say? Well, I'm going to do that same trick again. Since the masses are the same, I'm just going to list all the masses as m's. And like the last one then, m minus m is 0. And 0 times this velocity is 0. But over here, v2i, it's moving. Both of them are moving to start out with. So this doesn't cancel out this time. So we're left with 2m over m plus m, which is 2m. And 2m over 2m is 1. And so, according to the equations, the first ball should end up with the second ball's initial velocity. And it's a velocity. That means the first ball should end up going in the same direction with the same speed that the second ball was moving initially. Interesting. Well, let's see what happens to the second ball in this case. Well, here we have an m minus m, and m minus m is 0, and 0 times anything is 0, so that whole term cancels out. And over here, we have 2m over m plus m, which again is better known as 2m, and 2m over 2m is 1. And so this equation predicts that the velocity of the second ball will be the same as the initial velocity of the first ball. So do you see what it's predicting here? It's essentially predicting that the balls will exchange velocities. That means directions and speeds, right? Directions and speeds. So let's take a look at a real life example and see if this works. Here is the one small mass at different speeds. Okay, so it's small mass into small mass. Okay, you ready? Do you see them exchanging velocities? Notice how they bounce off of one another, so they're going in the direction of the other, uh, other little cart. Watch it again. Come back here, you. There we go. Here we go. See how they exchange velocities? And in fact, if we look at the data we got, that's what we see. All right, the first glider was going about 28, 27.9 centimeters per second beforehand. The right glider ended up going 27.3 centimeters per second after. So it basically took the first one's velocity. The uh, left glider, or sorry, the right glider was initially going to the left, negative 8.70, right? And the left glider ended up going uh, a little bit faster than that, but still in the ballpark, right? Still to the left, negative 9.21. Again, it's not exactly the same because... It's not completely uh, uh, elastic, right? But pretty close. So do you see that they actually are exchanging velocities here? Interesting. So this next one is a fun one. And I was really glad in the pivot that they had this one uh, as one of the uh, demos. And that is, what if the second one starts at rest, like the first one, but this time M1 is a lot bigger than M2? And that's actually how you write that, right? Those are greater than signs, but if you write two of them, it means a lot, a lot. 
Okay, like a lot, a lot, like in a calculusly kind of way, like it's infinitely bigger, bigger than M2. Now, obviously, we can't create that exact situation, but we can just make one a lot more massive than the other. Okay, so what's going to happen? Let's follow this through the equations. So here's the equation for the first one. Again, uh, like the first uh, case, the cart 2 starts at rest, so this whole thing will cancel. So what do we have over here? Well, what's M1 minus M2 equal to? Well, remember here, M1 is a lot, a lot, a lot bigger than M2. So if you subtract something very, very, very small off of something very, very, very big, don't you basically get M1 back? Like if M1 is a billion and M2 is 0.1, isn't a billion minus 0.1 basically a billion? And the same thing here. If M1 is a lot bigger than M2, then if you add it, a billion 0.1, really pretty much a billion, right? So in this case where M1 is a lot bigger than M2, M1 minus M2 and M1 plus M2 are basically both M1, and M1 over M1 is 1, and so it's predicting that the massive one is just going to keep rolling along. Now, you see this, right? If you were, let's say, uh, I had a, one of those bouncy balls, right? And you're driving by in your car. And I throw the bouncy ball off and it hits the windshield of your car. Now, there's a collision. But is your car going to slow way down? <laughs> no, right? It's just going to basically keep going. And that's because the mass of the car is so much bigger than the mass of the little bouncy ball. Okay? Now, how much bigger? Well, that's, you know, how much error do you want, basically. In this case, we're saying it in kind of like a calculus -y limit way, right? As, the, as M1 approaches infinitely bigger than M2. Okay. But here's the really interesting part. Because this one I probably could have convinced you of just by, you know, the bouncy ball example. What's going to happen to the bouncy ball? Right? So it starts at rest. Well, obviously it's going to start moving when it gets run into, but how fast? That's the interesting part. So again, um, V2i is zero because M2 starts at rest, so that whole thing drops away. And M1 plus M2 is essentially M1 because M1 is a lot, a lot, a lot bigger than M2. And so we have left over here 2M1 over M1, which is... And if you say M1, 2M1 <laughs> over M1 is, of course, 2, right? Work your fractions, people. Do your algebra. And so the second equation is telling us that that first one should bounce off at twice the velocity of the first one. The massive one just keeps rolling right along, and the really small one bounces off twice as fast. Like, what? Well, let's see if this works. Okay. So here we have the situation of huge mass into stationary tiny mass. Okay. Again, is it exactly what we're talking about? No. Neither is it exactly elastic, but it's pretty close, right? So watch what happens here. Now watch it again. Okay, do you notice that the massive one coming in from the right basically just keeps going? And that the tiny one goes off way faster, right? Watch. Right? It's definitely faster. Well, let's look at the data. Here's the left glider. It starts out at zero, right? Because it's at rest. The right glider was going to the left at about 32.6 centimeters per second, give or take a little bit. But look what happened after to it. Yeah, it slowed down slightly, but that's because two things. A, it is not an elastic collision. And two, it is not really an infinitely bigger mass. But it's pretty darn close, right? Look at how big that thing is. And it's got these little masses riding along with it. So it's a lot more massive than that little one, right? So it basically kept chugging along. But look what the little one did. 
almost twice the velocity, right? Same sign, went to the left, but about twice the velocity. Nature matching our physics and our math. Right? We can use math and physics to derive expressions that really do model reality, if it's actually a one-dimensional elastic collision. Don't get too set on these equations, okay? Um, I think I mentioned on the, the schedule doc that these are not on your equation sheet. But if you know them, you can certainly use them. Right? If you're taking the AP test and you put them in your calculator, that's legal, by the way. I'm not telling you to cheat. Okay, it's legal. Whatever you put in your calculator is okay for you to use on an AP test. They don't wipe the calculators out. So you want to put these two, figure out how to program them in your calculator, more power to you. Right? If it's an elastic collision. But don't overuse these. The tendency is that they're so nice because you just plug all the numbers in and work them through that people try to use them on every collision. And 99.9% .9 of your collisions are going to be inelastic to some extent. And then you only have momentum conservation. Now, sometimes at this point, I'll get people asking me, why is it twice? <laughs> right? Why did this teeny little mass end up going off at almost twice the velocity? Well, my answer is because that's what it has to do <laughs> for momentum and kinetic energy to both be conserved in this collision. Now, I know that that's not a, the answer you're kind of looking for, right? You want me to explain in some sort of touchy-feely way um, how we could have figured out that that would be twice as fast? I can't. It's too complex. Especially that conservation of kinetic energy equation with the one-half and the v-squareds right in there. It's too hard to think your way through unless you've got a really good number sense, <laughs> right? That's why we make the math models. It has to be two, because if it wasn't two, momentum and kinetic energy wouldn't be conserved. Right? So that really is the answer to that question. Why did it have to work out that way? Because that's the only way we can have an elastic collision right? and have both momentum and kinetic energy be conserved. Interesting, right? So it's, it's weird because, you know, again, in science, you haven't gotten to this place yet, but you're now at a place where you have to kind of dig into the math of things as we apply stuff, right, and be able to believe that math as a valid description of reality. Now, if you don't, of course, what you should do as a good scientist is test it, which is what we just did, right, at least with the pivot. In class, I usually take two carts and I put a whole bunch of mass, like six kilograms of mass or so on one cart. So that's not infinitely more massive, but still. And it does, you know, what we just saw here in the video. So again, trying to get you to understand the kind of hidden curriculum here that you can see in a good physics class. It's really a good class to see math, physics, science, nature, all rolling up into things that can be predicted if you know the rules. At least when we're talking Newtonian mechanics, right? As opposed to something that's probability-based like uh, quantum mechanics, right? But we're doing Newtonian mechanics now, and so it's all very much cause and effect. So I hope you uh, liked those little demos, and if you need to, you know, try some little examples yourself at home.